Lee Nicol, welcome to the Integral Chat. Um, thank you so much for joining us here. And I mean, this is a story that is so important, not just as a cautionary tale to young women, but to all people really about how we can improve how we treat human beings um, in life and especially on social media. But for any of our viewers and, and listeners on the podcast who don't uh, know anything about you tell me a bit about your background in football first of all yeah no problem well thank you for having me so I grew up in Glasgow in Scotland and I came through Celtics Academy so I spent um, about five years there up until I was 16 and then when I was 16 I made the decision to move down to North London to play for Arsenal and I spent two years there at the academy and then from that, um, I went on a bit of a journey. Um, I went to Redden to get first team experience um, with my old coach and Arsenal uh, legend, Jane Ludlow. So those that know the women's game will know Jane. Um, and she was a, a huge mentor to me on and off the pitch. And then she went to Wales and took over the national team there. So I kind of thought it was time for me to move on. Um, I always work better when I buy into someone uh, in particular. And then from there, I went to Millwall. Had a great time at Millwall. I know you're you're going to be laughing just now. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, oh, had a great time. <laughs> <laughs> um, I loved my time at Millwall. Um, had some of my favourite memories in football. And then I Millwall went into liquidation or administration from the female side of things. So um, at that point, I then made the decision to sign for uh, Charlton. Um, which those that are in the men's game will think you've been to all the London clubs that yeah. would happen in the men's game so but it's fairly normal in the women's game and um, because every club's grown at different different rates and mm -hmm. times and then I took a year out of the game after what happened to me with no intentions um, of returning and now I find myself at Crystal Palace where I've been for the last um, year and a half yeah, so a bit of a journey woman player. Um, I, I just just to say about Millwall, it is a good club, even though obviously we have our rivalries as a, as I'm a hammer, but it is a, is a great club. I do enjoy doing games there and I'm always treated really well there, unbelievably. The fans, you know, the fans are always so good with me. So it is a great club. I understand why you enjoyed it there. But obviously this uh, period, there was a really dark period of your life and career, which happened at Charlton. Was it 2019? Yes. Can no. you explain? I mean, you probably know the exact date and time where you were because I can imagine <laughs> what it must have felt like. So, can you t sort of describe what happened to you? Yeah, it's funny you say that. It was half past seven on a Saturday evening, 23rd of March, and I was sitting on my sofa drinking a vanilla latte. <laughs> um, but you do, don't you? you? You remember strange things and block out block out other things and it's really strange how your mind sort of operates like that but yeah I was sitting I was due to play Manchester United on a Sunday with Charlton and that season two teams got promoted to the Women's Super League so for anyone that doesn't know the women's game you've got the championship and usually it's only one up and one down and that season in particular there was two so Manchester United were at the top of the table Tottenham were second and we were third but there was nothing between us and Tottenham so um we were going into Manchester United um, with three games remaining and it was a huge game. If we could even get a point from it, it really did keep that hope of being promoted alive. Um, and it was Charlton's first season in the Championship as well, so a bit remarkable really. Um, so that was my biggest problem to that point. Um, that really sums up my life, really, my biggest problems in life has always been games and my ready. So I was sitting just with my housemate, my best friend who played for Tottenham as well. Um, so again, we were on this same journey and seeing who was going to be obviously getting that second spot. Watching, can't remember what it was, to be honest, Saturday Night TV. And I remember just getting a, a message on Instagram um, that just said, there's, there's videos of you and your partner going about. And I didn't have a partner. Um, so I was like, well, it's not me. Like, that's stupid. And completely in denial and didn't even question it really I was just I, I felt the need to respond though and usually I wouldn't respond but I don't know I felt the need to respond and he said no genuinely it's you 
And I was like, it's not. And he sent me a link. And again, still naive, didn't want to click on the link because I thought it was a virus. I thought this was someone trying to hack into me. Mm. Um, and then he sent me a screenshot. And I think from that moment, my world just stopped. Um, and no one can prepare you um, for something. I know there's much worse things that go on in the world and, and you know, when it comes to death and, and hardships that people go through, but no one's ever prepared myself for being exposed um, in the most humiliating way possible. Um, those videos, I was 23, obviously when I got notified about the hack, but I was actually 18 in the videos and I didn't remember that they, they, were, they, they had been taken. I didn't remember any of that because I guess when you're busy, you just move on with life. I don't really remember what I'd done last month in all honesty. So I just couldn't believe it. And I think just that evening alone, it will scar me the rest of my life, the feeling of being so vulnerable. I thought, I, I, I immediately thought I'm not, I'm going to lose all my friends and family. Um, I didn't think anyone would support me through it. I didn't know who to tell, I didn't know who to call. Um, and my first response was actually, I took myself up to my bedroom. I left my, my best mate on the sofa and I even kept it from her because I was so ashamed and I thought that perhaps I could get it down before having to tell anyone. And I've always held myself in such high regards with when it comes to, I'm a very open person, but I'm also a very close person when it comes to like really private things that mean a lot to me. Mm. Um, so I'm probably the biggest character in every changing room, but there's a lot that people don't know about me. There's, there's another side to me. So... Um, I'm a very not insecure person but mm. I'm an overthinker as it is but people would never know it so I took myself up and tried to keep it from from her and I didn't know what to do and I went I sat in my room um, the first time I had ever experienced panic attacks um, my body just went into a state of shock couldn't stop shaking it was trembling um, just nothing I'd ever ever experienced before I had never suffered with anything mentally there had never been any signs in the past that I was going to so it wasn't as if I was in an unhappy place anyway I was a very happy go lucky chilled out human being that really did care what people thought of me and I, I held myself um, in high regard to that so I remember sneaking downstairs tried to escape at half past ten at night my house <laughs> and Megan had said to me where are you going I said oh, I'm going to see my friend and she said Lee you've got a game tomorrow obviously like it's not normal and I said uh, and I just came out with it and she's like let's go jumped in the car turned up at the police station I just want them to look at me like I'm a human like I'm a, I'm a young girl I need your help right now and I just thought that that would speed the process up and maybe they could do something but turned up the police they were lovely but they told me that it was um, called a crime called revenge porn and from that it was like what do you mean I'm not associated to porn what do you mean and what do you mean revenge has someone done this to me so that name alone was quite traumatizing because I was like wait so one of my friends has done this because naturally where my head went and the fact that the police thought that I had created a, a porn movie was baffling but I didn't understand it at the time but they notified me that there was nothing that they could do um, that evening because they had to be on the streets because it's a Saturday night and there's a lot of crimes that go on in the streets and for me, that was the first sign of complete disappointment. It's the first time that I'd ever needed the police and they, they batted me off. Um, although they were nice, but they couldn't support me. And I guess that just summarises the, what the journey went on to then go and be. I just thought that people would be able to help. There's so much help out there. I couldn't have been further um, from the truth, really, with that. So the days after that, you can imagine, I, I had to... Um, I lied to a lot of people, pretended that I wasn't well so that I didn't need to play the game. But I went to the game so I could be named on a bench because I was still thinking about covering it up. So if I wasn't in the squad, people were going to ask questions. So it was just, I was living in this lie, trying to just lie to everyone, hoping that I could get it taken down. And I was emailing people all throughout the night because all these different websites and stuff that were hosting it are all different time zones. So I was emailing them on my own. I was Googling it on my own. And again, just the pain of having to go through that while I was grieving in a, in a way myself. Um, and then the dreaded mesh came out that other people had seen it, people that I had connections with. It had been on some football um, website, the link. And I think as soon as the, the football world got involved and that's when it really um, took off. And that was what was tough for me because on paper, Bianca, I'm, at that time, I trained for Charlton twice a week. I was on £200 a month and I had a full-time job. 
and mm-hmm. because of, but because I was attached to a Chadwick Athletic Football Club, it made headlines. Um, and I was just a not not even that even if I was a celebrity and not a normal girl, it still doesn't make it acceptable. But where I was at in life, I couldn't. I had never been prepared for life in the media, life in the, me- the public eye, and especially not given the context that what it was. So I found that really, really difficult. I had been thrown into this world and I had never been prepared for it um, in the worst possible way that you could be. Um, I had to have the conversation with my family. Um, that was the toughest, toughest part of it all. Um, I've never felt so vulnerable and I genuinely thought that they were going to disown me because I've never gave them a problem in my life. I've never had a boyfriend. I've never took a boy home. They've never met anything like that. And so you can imagine how big news it was, but it was actually my brother that I made the first call to. And I I remember just trying to get the words out and I couldn't, honestly, I I couldn't say it to him. And I I must have played it down so much. I was like, "Um, there's, there's a video that's going about of me um it's all right what are we talking I said like do you need to ask questions can't you just like put two and two together um and he's like how bad are you talking I said bad like and he's like I was like just went viral and he went what do you mean viral what, viral in your little circle and I was like I mean viral I mean like <laughs> worldwide and every whatsapp group chat you can imagine I'm trending on Pornhub and he was like right okay I'll phone you back right I think he knew at that point I had to leave work so that was like the initial stage of kind of the process of when it happened and how it happened and it, I don't know how I managed to survive that initial stage because it was it was a battle I, I didn't want to I didn't want to come out of it I just want I was praying every night that I tried to close my eyes that I just wouldn't wake up but I could I could I couldn't go to sleep let alone wake up so um every time I tried to close my eyes like I just uh, just shaking numb sickness I slept with a champagne bucket by my bed um so I was just rolling over being sick and that went on for many many days to be honest as a woman I can completely understand what you went through I mean obviously it's a violation of your privacy of your body you know the the shame that you must have felt even though you'd done nothing wrong I can completely understand um, what must have been going through your mind and the problem is once it's out there you know what it's, it spreads like wildfire and then it's everywhere and you can get it taken from one site but then it'll pop up somewhere else and someone else's whatsapp and people just share it not thinking about the consequences of what they're doing and because this has happened to many women a similar situation happened to myself um, with photos and things that were released of bikini shots and you know probably things that I would put on Instagram anyway, but when it's stolen from you, it's a completely different feeling. It's, it's like you've been violated your privacy and your body. So I completely get where you're coming from there. And there's nothing you can do about it. Absolutely nothing. 100%. I felt like the way I view it in my head now, and I don't want anyone to take this in the wrong way whatsoever, but in my head, it's, it's basically like cyber rape. It's like yeah. you've been. It, it, that's how. That's the only way I can describe it. Is a cyber rape, just mm-hmm. over and over and over again, and you're reminded exactly. of it constantly. And how do you ever move on when you're reminded of it every single day of your life, everywhere you go? Um, no one should ever have to. Whether it's just a topless picture, whether it's the full thing, whatever it is, it doesn't make it any worse or any better if there's something out there that you don't want to be out there I just think it is it's awful um, and the bigger picture of it is I'm going to have kids one day and I it's put me off having kids I do not the thought of them being brought up in a society where my kids may be bullied because of something that happened to me and I feel guilty about that every day of my life and I know people say you are the victim yeah to a degree I am the victim but I could have stopped it if I did if I if I thought at 18 that this could have happened I could I wouldn't have done it I would never ever have took the risk and I blame myself for that that's the part that I'm like I just wish that I could have looked at the bigger picture and thought what if but I was just so naive and I assumed that anyone that had naked pictures or videos out there online I genuinely thought that these celebrities wanted them out there that was me being so naive and they had done it themselves I didn't know that this was actually a pandemic in itself 
Mm. The thing is, if you people don't understand when they see these pictures of famous people and, you know, they share them around, they need to understand the, you know, the principle of consent. These images, they haven't allowed you to, to look at them. It is literally like, I liken it to standing at someone's window and watching a woman get undressed. Would you do that? Of course you wouldn't. So then why do you think it's acceptable to share videos, pictures of people in, you know, uh, in, in their own private lives? When, you, when it's in your phone, you think it's safe, but yeah. it's really not. And, that, and that's the biggest thing that, that young people, not just women, mm-hmm. need to understand. It can be in your phone, but it, it, it can easily be leaked, as we know. What I find really horrifying as well and, and like I said, it, it, it happened to me, not, not to the extent that, that it happened no, to you. It doesn't make it any, any better. Of course it doesn't. These were, these were pictures, you know, of, on, on the beach or something I might send my boyfriend. We lived yep. like, like long distance, mm-hmm. something that is, seems pretty innocuous. But when you think about lots of people looking at it and you haven't said that that's okay, it does make you feel sick. Yep. Um, yep. What, what then really kind of horrified me was the fact that people have to remind you of it all the time and send you the pictures or the screenshots the fact that you've said it still happens today which is awful in itself I mean how did it impact your life long term from that moment because we're talking like three years ago Mm -hmm. yeah we're coming up to three years now yeah and I made the the decision in my head that 12 months ago I was going to speak out prior to that so for what the 18 months leading up to that it was a constant mental battle in my head about me trying to be strong enough to push through it and just hope that one day I would genuinely be able to smile again naturally without forcing it hoping that one day I'd be able to walk out the door without feeling anxious that one day I'd get in my car and I wouldn't cry going to work because I was so I felt so guilty and I felt so shameful when that was honestly for 18 months I just suffered so much and after after the initial period of it all happening I didn't want to keep bringing it up to those around me because they suffered they suffered too massively and I guess it is like grief you have the funeral and everyone moves on back to their normal life but this never went away from me this battle in my head of I was terrified to walk into um, and a night out a bar a restaurant I couldn't for ages and every time I did I'd walk my body language you could if there was a camel and you'd probably be able to see like I'd put myself in the middle of the group so that I didn't bring any attention to me I used to always and now I'm back to wearing bright colors I always like dressing so differently to stand out it's always been part of me I would start dressing so that people weren't drawn to me and um, not that I dress colorfully so that people are drawn to me but it's just that was my style mm-hmm. so I used there was loads of things that I used to do to protect myself and feel safe but I hated every minute of my life for 18 months there was not one time that I could genuinely say that I felt content happy or safe and I would cry and have breakdowns and anyone that knows me just knows it's it's just the complete opposite to the lead that they knew So you have that constant battle and I didn't want to be alive. I didn't want to fight anymore. I didn't want to feel like this. Um, I didn't didn't want to go through it. Um, And obviously I think a big part of that as well was because I'd made this decision to step away from football, um, which had been my whole life since I can ever remember. It's the only childhood memories I've got is football. And after what happened that took that away from me because I didn't feel strong enough to go and compete. I didn't feel strong enough to go and worry about three points. It was the least of my worries. I didn't feel strong enough to potentially go on a football pitch and someone make a comment to me. Um, fans make comments to me. I couldn't I couldn't think of anything worse than put myself in more of a spotlight at all. So I just, to make the decision that was the easiest decision in the world was not to go back to football at that time I think that also had a massive knock-on effect on my happiness of that and that initial 18 months because I'd lost I'd lost my privacy and I'd lost my identity and I was this new version of me that no one recognized I wasn't bubbly I wasn't loud I went from being extremely extroverted to completely introverted it was different human being and it was constantly trying to put a mask on so that people didn't worry about me because I'm like what can they do like 
they know I'm not happy, but I don't want, I want them to be okay. Like I'm, I'm going to fight this. I knew all along, even though I was having those horrible thoughts in my mind, I knew all along that I'll fight it. Like I'll fight it until I can't fight it anymore. Like I'll get through it. But there was no sign that I was going to get through it. There was no little things that just keep hanging on in there. It was just, I didn't want to let people down. If I, if I acted the way that my brain wanted me to act, I just couldn't put my my mum and my niece and my nephews through that pain. And I didn't want to, I didn't want my niece and nephews to grow up thinking that when life gets tough, you take yourself away from it. And I felt quite strongly about that because I was always their idol. Mm. And I didn't ever want to open up that can of worms to them that that's an option for them. Mm. And I think that's the only thing that just kept me going and putting up with it and putting up with the comments putting up with everything that I felt, but not one part of me was was happy. Um, I was a state to say that, um, to say, <laughs> sorry, I've got a cough. <laughs> I was a state, but when I, when lockdown happened, lockdown number one, um, I'm very fortunate that for me that saved my life. Um, it gave me an opportunity to breathe without being in pain. It gave me an opportunity to just wake up in the morning, not worry about having to see people. and. It gave me an opportunity to go and self-educate myself, accept what's happened because I hadn't accepted that myself. I was probably my own worst enemy. Um, in that time, the initial three months, I just worried about me and I went and started getting myself fit again, exercising. I, that was a different goal, so I had a different focus. Um, I lost a bit of weight because I'd put on a bit of weight after, well, I'd put on a, a bit of weight after it happened because I wasn't exercising. Mm. Um, and I lost that all and I started finding happiness and other things again and then um, Crystal, I went into the with Crystal Palace and from that I started to, I was like, wow, like, okay, that's the happiest I've felt and I remember just going to training and just thinking this is the best moment of my whole career, just being back in this football pitch and I don't care if I play, don't play, nothing, I just care about I'm back at training and this feeling like I just felt like such a, a softy person in my head. I'm like, I'll never take this for granted ever again in my life because to people, Crystal Palace weren't doing very well in the championship. Um, they didn't win much at all. Um, but I went and it was just the highlight of my career, just returning to that football pitch and how it made me feel and how I was accepted. Um, I was just viewed as the person that they knew and nothing more and then when they wanted to sign me, goodness me, it was like I was like a little kid all over again. It was like getting my first call up to Scotland. Um, but it was that was the only thing I could compare it to. And I was like, wow, like you really want to sign me? He's like, yeah, of course I do. And I was like, wow. And I remember actually then my initial worry then was, oh my god, this is going to get announced. Like this is going to bring it all back up again. And naturally, that I was like, oh goodness, I better tell the club because I didn't know if the club knew. And um, and I told the club and. I think I'm quite fortunate that it was a, we've got a female general manager. So she she was like, oh my goodness, like went into mum mode. She's like, are you okay? And I was like, yeah, yeah, I'm just if you if you don't want to announce it, that's okay. And she's like, do you want us to announce it? And I was like, I'm happy either way. It'd be lovely for me to be like, I'm coming back, but I would never want to bring more attention to me. I just want to disappear um, in the club. Um, the men's team, media team and stuff, they all got on it. They were made aware the safeguarding team was put in touch with me just in case, just to prepare me in case anything comes. And it was absolutely fine. And I had built this moment up to be something that it wasn't. And that was for me the, the start of my real recovery. And it was like, wow, well, okay. And then when I spoke out six months after that, January last year, that was the final road to recovery for me. It was like, I've had my say on it. Um, this is the first time that I've ever spoke about it. I am a human being, that person you're looking at and that link on your WhatsApp group chat. Do you know I'm someone's sister and someone's daughter and someone's friend? And it broke me. And if you need to hear how much it broke me to maybe look at these things differently and consider it as one of your own daughters in the future um, or your mum or whoever it is related to you that hits, hits that spot to make you think, then that's what I'll do. And as soon as I spoke out, yeah, the trolling's been much worse. Um, but I feel confident walking into rooms now because the way that people address me and look at me, it's no longer, you're that girl in the sex tape. It's like, I read your story, like, it's amazing. And I'm like, we're talking about the same thing, but your, your approach to it is completely different. And it means the world to me because then I'll conversate with people over it rather than people saying to me, I had a wank in my hotel room over you earlier. And I'm thinking, who are you? 
and why do you feel the need to come up to me in a night out when I'm happy? And as soon as men say that, I literally run. I'm out the door, I'm home, I'm crying on a train home, I'm phoning my best friend saying, can you pick me up? I can't do this anymore. And now I walk in and the similar subject will be brought up, but the way that they approach it is so much better and I can handle that and I'm okay with it. Mm. As women, we always get those kinds of messages, don't we? I mean, it is, it's awful, but it is just par for the course being on social media but I'm so glad that you made the decision to get through it you took control of your own story you reframed it and now obviously um, you're in a completely different um, place in your life which is fantastic and it's probably made you a stronger person you shouldn't have to go through shit like that to make you this strong and resilient but you know it's happened so now what do we do about the future and how we can change the way um, these things happen because you know people are still going to get hacked and mm -hmm. you're going to get weird trolls and weird pervy guys texting you and messaging you but we we have the the, the campaigns um, brilliant campaigns from kick it out and show races in the red card and um, there's rainbow laces, there's no room for racism. We don't seem to have a campaign around how women in the game are treated and the, the, the sexist attitudes, misogyny, yeah. um, that a section of football fans, you, you, you can read it on the forums, you can have the direct messages, I'll get them myself and I know most yeah. women in football do. What, is, there, is there a sort of um, a scope for, creating a campaign that, that all women and men can get behind to perhaps change the way these things are treated? I think there's there's always scope for anything that's going to make the world better. Um, but I don't think there's any point in starting a campaign if people aren't prepared to listen and understand and not listen, not listen to hear, not not listening to respond, listening to understand, and it's two completely different things. I think a, a lot of the time people will listen to already have their comment on their head that they want to comment back. But we need to get to a point where us as individuals and those around us and those around those people are willing to understand how it feels and maybe and just maybe walk a day in our shoes um, because I think people just want to attack it and think, oh, it's, feel sorry for women, women aren't safe, but mm. women shouldn't play football, women should be in the kitchen. It's all boring and I'm not angry at it. I just want people to be better than they were yesterday. And that's all I can ask. And that is one thing that all the uh, racism campaigns that has gone on, one thing that they've done is make, made me a better person because I've been willing to hear, because I was so oblivious. I had no idea that half the things were going on. But I opened my ears and I asked some of my friends from the black community, can you explain to me, what, what do you mean? Because I am i don't think it goes on around me. And little things that they explained to me, I was horrified. I was like, I'm so sorry that you go through that. And all it takes is being prepared to listen and being prepared to become aware that there's issues you don't need to agree but you just need to be prepared to listen and say nothing if you don't agree. You don't need to comment. You really don't. Um, so for me, I think it's just, we need to get to a point where more people than not <coughs> want to listen. Mm. The people that are heading up the campaign were not angry. I, th I don't think it comes across well when people are angry because naturally you other people get defensive and want to fight back. I think it needs to be a positive campaign it needs to be people that talk well are listened to well they're respected and get the point across from a non-emotional point of view just like this, this is how it is um and but i think we've got many of them them women in this country alone and in london alone that couldn't really go and make a difference like you've got yourself alone um but yeah it's hard because do i think that they the people that we're trying to get through to are going to listen yet? I don't think so. It is something that we really kind of need to look at, I think, on a on an official basis and sort of bring it to the level of those other campaigns that have done such good work, like Ray Rainbow Laces and... 100%. Um, 
yeah it's horrifying it's that's the reality of it is and I think we all try to just move forward with our lives but then you're reminded by something like that and it's like no something does need to be done and Mm. I try not to go down a rabbit hole with it because it certainly is a rabbit hole when it's like I just want to scream from the rooftop I don't hate men there's a small minority of you that I dislike but I don't hate men in general because I've got a lot of good experience with men but if I had to categorize my experience with men I'd hate them all yeah and I would only ask that they have that same outlook back and I would love something to be done but do I think that I think the generation that's going to change already has at the minute in terms of like men have been so much more open to watching games and actually like, you know what it's all right um but I think I don't think we'll move the other ones too much because I think they're just angry people that just mm. view women as being objects that are just robots and to just stay doing what they're doing but I do think that younger generation needs to be the target the ones that are in schools and just educate them like we are all the same just because you're a boy and I'm a girl, we come from the same place and we go to the same grave. In our journey, it'll be very similar. We just take different paths in life. Yeah. And I think it needs to start from a young age because I think that's the only real way to make a change that's sustainable. Mm. Um, but unfortunately, I don't think we'll, we'll see the benefit of that. No. Because we'll, we'll, be, we'll be old. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no one will care about our bodies anyway then, so it's fine. <laughs> I do. I, I'm kind of heartened when I think about my nephew watching football now and he sees that women play the game and he sees that women report on it and present football. You know, they're becoming a lot more visible in broadcasting and on the pitch. So I kind of hope that that the, our identities will shift in that way and we won't just be seen as these, these objects. I'm, I'm hoping for my nephew's generation anyway, he's only six, but... Um, all we can do is fight the good fight and, and continue exactly. that. But um, as far as your life now and all the positive things, I don't want to end on, on all the rubbish stuff. So I know that you are involved with Fraser Franks in B5 Consultancy. You've got a football podcast. You're still playing the game, which is brilliant. Tell us a, a little bit about, you know, all some of the amazing stuff that you do and what makes you happy now. Yeah, so now what I get to do with B5 and Fraser and Matt is, go into Premier League clubs, EFL clubs, WSL academies, cricket national teams and, and New Zealand rugby clubs. And I get to go and not just share my experience, but use that as a small part of the journey, but educate people on how to be safe online. Um, and that's not just the boring stuff. That is like, this is how to deal with trolling. That's how to try and avoid as much as possible. But this is how to be yourself as well without solely attaching yourself as a football player or a rugby player because that has its own problems itself long term, which I absolutely love because I'm sitting in front of youngsters that really do listen and they are really respectful. And I love walking away from that room thinking, as soon as I mention sex to those boys, they giggle and you can see them. But as soon as you walk out of it, I've got my followers on Instagram. They're messaging saying, thank you so much. Like, I really appreciated that chat. And I live for that because it's like laugh and snigger all you want. <laughs> but then come the end of it, it's just amazing seeing the difference in their body language. And they don't blink or they literally just don't take their eyes off you when you're telling the story because I think they're like, oh my goodness, I never thought I'd meet a girl that I've had in my WhatsApp group chat. Um, so I love those moments. And I love educating young girls in terms of, this happens to boys as well. Boys are victims of this as well. Don't get me wrong. Um, but I like to educate the girls on. I can tell girls don't make the same decisions that I did in life. Um, I don't want to tell boys what to do. But with girls, I feel a lot more comfortable saying, I was you. I was sitting in your uh, situation at WSL Academy at your age. And this is when I made a decision to do this. Please don't do it. And if you're going to do it, take your identity out of it. That, that's my, if you if you feel the need to do it because of relationships and traveling and it's a big part of relationships just take your identity out of it whether that's your face tattoos then it can never come back on you yeah. um, so that's a huge thing that I love but I'm also doing lots of other stuff um working and um, got a legal case going on in the US to to tackle uh, Pornhub in terms right. of um all the illegal offences that they commit on there and the idea of that is not to shut them down but to get them to change their their settings and their privacy and their security because if, if Pornhub just shut down you've got loads of other sites but Pornhub show that there's a way to change this to become a safe place and um, 
it's just for for professional porn stars that want to be on there consensually yeah. then that's all I ask and um, so I've got that I, I am I'm working on a, an amazing project at the now that I can't speak about too much but I'm working with an intelligence company that is helping me track down individuals that have told me um, and we're trying to show those individuals that there's consequences for that again it's not because I take joy in that I think it's just really important to educate people and make them aware that that person that you've been slating and you've been talking about and you've been putting their video on websites she exists and she's going to be sitting right in front of you um, and I think often people forget that that I'm just a normal person and there's a chance that we could bump into each other mm -hmm. um, but there's loads of amazing things going on I could only say that I wake up every morning really happy about trying to go and make an, like make a difference and raise awareness not just for intimate image abuse or revenge porn but just trying to make society in particular online a better place to be mm. that's a brilliant brilliant way to end this chat lee it's been so good to talk to you good luck with all of those ventures you've got lots going on i'm really pleased that you dug yourself out of that hole and you now seem to be shining and, and flying and flourishing so it's brilliant to see Thank you so much. It's been my honour.